the main purpose of contact tracing is to identify new uh, potential cases among close contacts of known Ebola cases as early as possible in their, in their disease course. And that's very important for several reasons. It is a key element of outbreak control uh, to identify people as early as possible and being able to isolate them as early as possible, such as to reduce onward transmission in the community. We know, for example, that in the current uh, outbreak in West Africa, it takes on average about five to six days for people to uh, attend Ebola treatment units. And those are five to six days during which people have contacts with various people within their household, but are also outside their household. Um, and with a, a, a lot of potential for onward transmission in the community. So identifying people early on in their disease course and isolating them early from the communities is the main purpose. The other reason, of course, is that uh, for patients themselves to be identified early and provided with treatment early on uh, increases their likelihood of survival and their general outcome. Um, and that's very important for the patients as well. That Ebola is transmitted through body fluids, so urine, blood, feces, uh, vomit. Um, and so anyone who's been in direct contact with such fluids will be considered as a contact. Also, anyone who's been in direct physical contact with uh, a patient will be considered as a contact. And then people who've been in contact with their clothes or their bed linen will be considered as contacts. Um, and then a fourth category is anyone who's been in contact uh, or has shared a meal on a daily basis um, with a known Ebola case and shared a kitchen will be considered as a contact. So essentially, it's mostly household contacts. You can also have contacts in the community with relatives or other community members. And there would be, if they have had such contact, it would be considered as contact for the contact tracing. Uh, an example, for example, is traditional healers who um, uh, could have been in contact with the patient during their course of illness. There's many different aspects of contact tracing after burials. Um, of course, burials are super spreading, potential super spreading events uh, if they're community burials because people will be touching the body uh, and many people may be attending uh, uh, the funeral. Um, there's particular individuals who will be at more at risk, those who transport the body, those who prepare the body. And contact tracing in, in those circumstances are generally more than just household contacts or close relatives, but will be many more people in the community. There's um, various ways of finding people, finding contacts, but essentially when patients are being admitted or when patients are being identified by case investigation teams in the field, they will be asking questions about their exposures and their contacts over the last few days since their onset of symptoms. Uh, when patients are uh, very unwell, uh, will rely on a family or close relatives to also answer those questions. And sometimes patients may be dead on arrival as well. And so exclusively that will rely on asking questions to relatives. It's some, sometimes quite difficult to um, obtain information on contacts simply because patients may not want to give that information out because they don't want to give the details of their contacts uh, by fear of stigma, by fear of uh, all sorts of, sort of social pressure um, and may not want to give their addresses as well. Uh, so there's various challenging, uh, challenges in identifying the contacts. When contacts are being found, they'll be followed up for 21 days by the contact tracing teams. 21 days is the maximum incubation period for Ebola. Um, and so contacts will be followed up for 21 days after their last exposure with the case. In practice, what happens is that if patients are being ad admitted to Ebola treatment units, uh, there will be, their contacts will be followed up for 21 days after their day of admission. Uh, and for those 21 days, the contact tracing teams will uh, do door-to-door -door visits, of contacts in their households, ask about their signs and symptoms, and try to identify anyone who might uh, be unwell. Um, there's challenges, of course, as well in identifying contacts daily because contacts may not be at home, contacts may move, maybe in other places. Um, and so that's sometimes difficult to actually uh, being able to interview everyone uh, on a day. But that information is probably sometimes collected from whoever is in the household and will be asked questions about everyone else in the household. Um, the contact tracing is also an opportunity for community engagement and certainly health awareness messages and contacts will be uh, told about what to do if they become unwell, how to isolate themselves, what the signs and symptoms are of Ebola and all health promotion messages. When we found someone with symptoms, when the contact tracing teams find someone with uh, symptoms, the next step is to inform case investigation teams and ambulance services. Uh, contact tracers themselves are generally not allowed to touch the patients because they don't have the uh, appropriate gear and equipment with them to do that, uh, personal protective equipment. Generally, they will always ask their question and, and keep that distance, two meter distance from individuals. 
Um, so the, the next step is to, is to identify, so contact case investigation teams for uh, those teams to then properly investigate the case and see whether they meet the case definition should be um, uh, offered treatment or care in an Ebola treatment unit. Uh, one of the main problems is capacity. Uh, certainly when the outbreak is, the, the, the number of cases is doubling every 20 or 30 days, uh, the number of contacts will increase in that proportion as well. Um, and it's very difficult to increase capacity to uh, that level as well. So there's been a lot of challenges with increasing capacity properly. Also because contact tracing teams are generally uh, made of people who are community members, community health volunteers, community health workers, and uh, to increase capacity would actually be pulling out people from other programs to do contact tracing. So there's, there's challenges in doing that. I know that in many areas contact tracing has stopped at the peak of the epidemic or where there were too many, too, too many patients and the system was completely overwhelmed. Uh, when the number of cases decrease, certainly contact tracing is something to do because it's a key element of, of outbreak control. Um, certainly another challenge as well is community acceptance and how contact tracing is being perceived by communities. And I think contact tracing will probably only work well if uh, communities perceive it as useful, understand the purpose of contact tracing, and that goes hand in hand with community engagement and awareness campaigns.